Welcome, welcome, welcome to the last English speaking union happy hour of our second season. We started the season back in January and now five months and 13 speakers later, we're wrapping up with storied and scandalous Kansas City, a history of corruption, mischief, and a whole lot of booze, a very fitting topic and send off for our last happy hour of the season. I'm, as always, Joshua Keppel Gonzalez, Director of Branch Services at the English Speaking Union of the United States. And it should come as no surprise that today's happy hour is sponsored by the Kansas City branch of the ESU. As ideas for these lectures come from you, our members and viewers, please share any ideas or topics for an upcoming speaker or talk using the survey that will appear at the end of our program tonight. Before we get into that program, I want to make a couple of quick technical announcements. After the presentation, we will be holding a question and answer session. You can enter your questions into either the Q&A module or the chat module. Buttons to both of those are located at the bottom of your Zoom screens. You can do this at any point during the presentation. It doesn't have to be during the Q&A portion. We will get to the questions in the order that we receive them. In addition, we will be running a raffle for two copies of Carla's book. So please do try to stay till the end of the Q&A to win a copy. I also want to take a moment uh, to recognize the branches with the most registered members for today's happy hour. They are the Sand Hills Pine Hills branch in, uh, sorry, Sand Hills Pinehurst branch in North Carolina, our Central Florida branch in Central Florida, and of course, our Kansas City branch. Uh, now, to really start us off today, I'd like to welcome the president of the Kansas City branch and ESU happy hour committee member, Jeff Schnabel. Jeff. Uh, thank you, Josh. I would like to welcome everyone to today's happy hour. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. And for those who don't live in Kansas City or have never visited here before, our metro area crosses the state line between Kansas and Missouri. So, so Kansas is about a five minute drive from my home. Since this program spotlights Kansas City, I thought that I would briefly mention some fun facts about Kansas City. Kansas City has over 200 fountains and is called the City of Fountains. Only Rome has more fountains than Kansas City. Kansas City is home to the only museum in the US dedicated to World War I. In 2004, Congress designated the museum as the United States official museum for World War I. Kansas City has more barbecue restaurants per capita than any city in the US. And we have many public and private parks throughout the city. One public park called Swope Park is more than twice the size in acres from uh, of Central Park in New York City. And for sports fans, the Kansas City Royals baseball team has won the World Series twice in 1985 and in 2015. And of course, the Kansas City Chiefs have won Super Bowls in 1970 and in last year in 2020. But now we turn to Kansas City's past. How did this city along the Missouri River come to be? Well, there is no better person to answer that than our guest speaker today, Carla Hurst Deal. Carla lives and works as a writer, poet, researcher, and freelancer in Kansas City, Missouri. She has a master's of fine arts in creative writing and media arts from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. In November, 2019, she published her first book, Storied in Scandalous Kansas City, A History of Corruption, Mischief, and a Whole Lot of Booze. Carla is the founder and editor of Squeezebox City, which is an online magazine dedicated to the history and culture of Kansas City. She has been involved with most of Kansas City's regional history groups, including the History of Kansas City Foundation, Young Preservationists, Historic West Bottoms, and Jackson County Historical Society. She also works in communications 
for the Friends of the Kansas City Public Library and volunteers for several local nonprofits. Today, Carla takes us back in time to a place in Kansas City we would not recognize today. Yet it was a time when the ESU Kansas City branch was founded and fortunately made it through its first 100 years. So as Josh mentioned, after the Q&A, we will give away two of Carla's autograph books. Uh, for those who would like to, to purchase her book, they're available, of course, in any bookstore, Amazon, or, or actually her website, carladeal.com. For this happy hour, Carla invites you to try her easy to make cocktail called the Champagne Cocktail. So let's give a warm welcome to Carla Deal. Hello and greetings to everyone. I am so excited to invite you from around the nation to come in and fill your cup and enjoy some scandalous history of Kansas City. The Roaring Twenties brought on grand illusions of a country teeming with glitz, glam, grandeur, and success. But as we all know, the Twenties were only roaring for about 1% of the population. Under the surface, Americans began deeply searching for identity. Our post-war society was hungry for prosperity and meaning, and we demanded it any way we could and often in extreme opposites. There was indulgence and temperance science and religion, integration and segregation. We were empowered, but also power hungry and growing hungrier. The jazz age just burst at the seams with ingenuity and innovation. Women finally gained the right to vote. We had nearly 35,000 American citizens who were millionaires and millions of new people were playing the stock market. The assembly line had just revolutionized our productivity and our profitability. We flew a plane entirely around the world. The entertainment culture was at an all time high. With literature, music and the arts, radio was streaming through households everywhere. We began debating evolution and Darwinism and prohibiting booze, but also producing more than ever on the black market. It was, as they say, an era of extremes. It's when we first met Winnie the Pooh, but also T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. We were an expressive country full of artists, visionaries, entrepreneurs, industry barons, and yet at a time when the trench between the wealth and impoverished deeply widened, still those oppressed people were rising up, prompting social and political activism on both sides of the spectrum. It was a decade marred by the resurgence and the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan, juxtaposed by the founding of the American Civil Liberties Union and the Universal Negro Improvement Union and the very, very powerful explosion of black arts, music, literature, and the intellects of the Harlem Renaissance. But with all of our cultural developments, we were in the throes of growth as a nation and we couldn't exactly agree on how to do it. From the era of the Civil War to the 1920s, we can look at Kansas City as a microcosm of our industrious nation, rife with corruption and scandal. When we begin to think about what it takes to grow and modernize a nation, we will discover that all industries of society progress on the backs of labor. In Kansas City, you could not grow a city without the workforce able to carve through the limestone to make way for the streets. You couldn't build the skyline without a workforce molding the bricks by hand. You could not pri provide transportation and simulate the economy without the Gandhi dancers heaving and hoeing and laying the rails or building the Hannibal Bridge, the first ever to span over the tumultuous, unbridgeable Missouri River. This bridge in and of itself ushered in real prosperity to Kansas City. There is nothing to enjoy or to cherish in a modern urban environment that was not touched by the hands of labor. The building of America is reflected in the building of its working class comprised mostly of immigrants. 
Before World War I, close to 60% of the industrial labor force in the United States was foreign born. Kansas City was a mighty place steeped in centuries worth of corruption and scandal, bootleg barrels full. Corruption so smartly crafted, so intricately sewn, so unavoidably effective that we are arguably still unwinding from it nearly 130 years later. Corruption was so great in reach, it was described as a gigantic underworld octopus that reached its tentacles into business, public office, law enforcement, and even the privacy of home. No one escaped the demands of the machine, as it was called. But how did Kansas City get there? What had to occur to give total control of the state of Missouri and even further throughout the US to one man who was not even in a high political position? Why did the machine thrive? How was it established? Who suffered from it and who gained from it? Why did the good natured folks of a Midwestern city in the heart of the Bible Belt allow such corruption to continue unparalleled, unquestioned, and in fact, to support it? To begin to understand, we need to go back to the beginning back to the days when Kansas City wasn't even called by its name yet. It was just a dusty, dirty, dingy frontier town, literally on the edge of the wild tumultuous lands to the west. It attracted a curious lot. It was lawless and as scrappy as it gets. The populations that gathered here reflected that. Kansas City, known as the best, si best town this side of hell, the Paris of the Plains, modern Sodom, Athens of the West, home to the wettest block in the world and we earned our nicknames. The massive residential growth from 6,000 people in 1865 to 280,000 in 1905 brought with it thousands of young scrappy immigrant men who crowded into the working class neighborhoods such as Vinegar Hill, Juniper, or Hell's Half Acre, a shanty district among several others that consisted of deplorable living conditions. They were an impoverished people working in the packing houses and stockyards for 14 to 16 hours a day for a nickel an hour. The workers needed an advocate. They needed help navigating a foreign land and they needed a place to put their loyalty and boy did they find what they were looking for in James Big Jim Pendergast. Saloon owner turned ward boss Jim Pendergast introduced the workers to the all scratch your back if you scratch mine mentality that was the very beginnings of machine politics. The infamous Pendergast family seen here packed their belongings and moved from Galapagos, Ohio to St. Joseph, Missouri in 1859 when Jim was only three years old. Not long after he moved to Kansas City in 1876, strong ties to the working class developed because he spent his days toiling in the foundries among the workers. Jim's gradual rise to power gained momentum only eight years later after his arrival in the grimy bottomlands when he was elected delegate to represent the sixth ward. Jim's advocacy for and protection of the blue collar workers in his neighborhood solidified a strong political base of freight handlers, switchmen, factory workers, packing house men, grocers, bakers, butchers, and drovers. And it was a base that only continued to grow. He was a sympathetic man beloved by his people for his efforts to improve the lives of the underserved. Jim fought against a proposal from city government that would cut firemen's salaries by 15%. He fought on behalf of the people of the West Bottoms again when he opposed an ordinance that would have removed the only fire station to serve his ward. He advocated allocating funds to build the West Terrace Park on the unsightly bluffs overlooking the bottomlands. He offered up bail when 10 workers were caught playing bunko and were arrested. Pendergast also advocated lower gas rates and telephone rates. He established the first waterworks works plant and pushed for financing the construction of a parks and boulevard system that we are famous for. He pledged $20,000 to the city's first garbage system. He was charitable, of course, but he also knew if he kept the people fed at dinner time and with coins rattling in their pockets, that you'd have a guarantee they would turn the votes at the polls. In a time of great racial divide, Pendergast extended his friendship and all the favors that came with that to the black workers of the first ward. Then Big Jim grew in popularity among the working class, a group described by a local newspaper at the time as hard handed men of the first ward, the oily blue jumpers with packing house mud in their boots, switchmen, freight handlers, engineers, and lots of them too. They were not a mini silk hats in this crowd. 
The first ward was home to the famous wettest block in the world. It was one of the densest blocks for consumption, occupying the 1700 block on 9th Street near State Line in the Stockyard District. It was home to most of the labor jobs in Kansas City. Here was a land full of transplants, vagrants, immigrants working the saloons, the packing houses, and in nearby factories. From 1865 to 1918, 27.5 million immigrants poured into the United States. Early 1900s, West Bottom saw an influx of 2,000 Czechs, 4,000 Bohemians, 100 Russians, 2,000 Croatians, 100 Polish, Slovenians, and many other Eastern European immigrants fleeing tension, tumult, and political oppression in their own homelands. They too landed jobs in the stockyards and meat packing houses, iron working factories and steel plants and lived in the West Bottoms or nearby Armordale, which is a neighborhood that was built in 1889 on the river of Kansas for the sole purpose to house the abundance of stockyard workers. It grew in population so fast that by 1920, the neighborhood was severely overcrowded and basic needs of its residents could not be met. The Immigration Commission toured the community's muddy streets and closely spaced residences and described it as a labyrinth of narrow, dirty passageways flanked by the most nondescript sort of shacks. The wettest block was vile to outsiders, but instigated a sense of camaraderie among its occupants who relied on it for more than its vice. It was a genuine reprieve from a very hard way of life, but also served as a community center for the residents occupying the shanties. The saloons would also cast checks on Saturdays, proving again a necessary asset to the working class. At the height of the booze industry on the wettest block, almost every bar employed a barkeep from a different country. Opponents of alcohol called this area a disgrace, a curse, an excruciating and demoralizing place fueled by corruption and vice. Anti-saloon propagandists and prohibitionists from Kansas lamented that here indeed was where Missouri tempted, corrupted, and plied Kansans with liquor. And without question, it did. Beyond the establishment of his following in the working class, an important vehicle for Jim Pendergast's political power was ultimately his connection to and control of the police department. Pendergast lent a hand in electing Democrat James A. Reed as mayor, indebting Reed to Pendergast, making him more powerful than ever before. Between 1900 and 1902, Jim personally chose 123 out of the 173 patrolmen who served the Kansas City Police Force. This granted him immeasurable power. Kansas City had never experienced a concentrated amount of power in one individual. And for a time, Jim Pendergast was thought of as a prophet. Rivals to the Pendergast machine were the Shannon brothers, specifically Joe Shannon, who was a Democrat boss gaining power in a neighboring district. The euphemistic spirit animals long representing the long rivalry between the powerful Pendergast posse and the Joe Shannon were known as goats and their opponents, the Shannon led rabbits. Pendergast crew was nicknamed for the prevalent backyard pets of choice in their working class Irish neighborhood. The Shannon clan lived in the Creek Valley below earning their association with the rampant rabbits there. Each had rule over his own domain with Pendergast goats comprising the hills and Shannon's rabbits along the river. For the most part, the camp stayed out of each other's way due to forced compromise until a rising political star reeled in all the power in the 1920s. Jim Pendergast began losing his good health and by 1910 had initiated the shift in duties to his well-groomed younger brother, infamous brother Tom. Thomas Tom Pendergast, he was an ox of a man built for strong arming, landed in the dusty world of West Bottoms and quickly became appointed as the superintendent of the street, a coveted position of power. The arrival of Tom or TJ to his friends, Pendergast marks a pivotal moment in the development of Kansas City. This 20 year old who kept books for his brother's saloons was described as a thick skulled, heavy jowled oaf. He came out of the door swinging, landing huge political roles such as the county marshal. A Republican backed black newspaper spoke out in favor of young Pendergast and said, Mr. Pendergast's term as marshal established a new era in the penal progress. 
He stood for the black man as well as the white man. No cruel statement of prisoners, no jail scandals. Let us try him again. The importance of securing the vote of the growing black community in Kansas City caused both the Republican and Democratic parties to employ high levels of manipulation against an already defenseless group. Here's a short history. Once the 15th Amendment granted freed slaves the right to vote, the Republican Party had a short-lived hold on the vote. With the increase of the Black population in Kansas City expanding from only 190 in 1860 to 8,100 in 1880 and growing to 13,000 by 1900, this was an important voting demographic. The crux of securing the Black vote for the Democratic Party stemmed from smearing the hypocrisies of the Republican Party while also hypocritically maintaining the support of the white supremacists and attempting to rebrand itself as the great ally of the black people. Turn of the century, nearly 25% of the packing house workforce were African-Americans. Due to the segregated labor industry in Kansas City, where only 30% of businesses would employ black people and anti-discrimination claims and propaganda from large companies like Armor Packing Company, who needed a malleable workforce, the black population was drawn to the meatpacking profession. Workers piled in and the livestock industry became the first million dollar a month and then million dollar a day business. The Kansas City stockyards were the second largest in the country next to Chicago. By 1914, the yards employed 20,000 people, spanned 200 acres and could process 170,000 animals daily. Under this high productivity, its laborers suffered greatly. They were expected to debristle a pig carcass in two seconds and dehead a cow in only 10. Lacerations, bruises, swollen joints were among daily common occurrences when you spent your days toiling hunched over carcasses. More harrowing side effects were the loss of limbs, severe arthritis, muscular disabilities, and death. In the early 1900s, nearly 40,000 packing house workers died annually in the United States. Entry-level stockyard laborers had the privilege to find employ in the following positions. A knocker, a sticker, a header, a gut snatcher, a kidney puller, a splitter, rumper, backer, grinder, trimmer, cheeker, boner, puller, and lugger. The following excerpt was written by John Heron, Kansas City Public Library's new executive director, and describes a day in the life of the factory like this. The process began with livestock driven into the factory where a knocker hit the animals with a heavy sledge, rendering them unconscious. Another worker attached the animal's hind legs to a mechanical hoist and then hoisted them over the head rails. A sticker moved in and in one quick motion sliced the throat, causing the animal to bleed out. A team of knife men with sharp tools in each hand then removed the animal's valuable hide. A header followed, detached the skull, a gut snatcher took the intestines, and a kidney puller removed the animal's other internal organs. Splitters armed with heavy cleavers sliced down the backbone, cutting the animals in two, and as the carcass moved across the killing floor, the animals were met by rumpers, backers, grinders, trimmers, cheekers, boners, pullers, and luggers who processed the remaining meat. It was a small army of entry-level laborers who helped the process along by moving carcasses, cutting off tails and horns, and cleaning up the blood. We're done with talking about that. So was the plight of Kansas City's laborers in the packing houses and stockyards, and the city continued to find ways to speed up productivity while driving labor costs down, using a method of continuous flow, meaning the conveyor belt never stopped. An influx of unskilled immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe plus rural white men and blacks immigrating from the South continued to fill these menial, endless positions. This multi-ethnic workforce, where, by the way, the black workers made exactly half of the white workers' wages, essentially became the backbone of modernizing food production. This integrated and diverse workforce changed the racial landscape of labor forever. Although Missouri wanted and relied on the immigrant, we also wanted to assimilate to the social and cultural customs of America. In 1920, we coined the term Americanization to define the process. Programs were enforced to help, especially with the newly migrated Mexican population who would attend Americanization classes in Kansas City. 
Although we'd been making the transition from rural to urban for decades, 1920 was the first year that urban populations surpassed rural populations in American history. And understanding this tradition from reliance on rural and agricultural industries to one of urban and all the social and cultural changes that that entails points to deep tension brewing among radicalized groups with opposite opinions on how Americans should live and who should be allowed to live here. Welcome to the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan's resurgence in the 20s can be tied to the internationalization and the modernization of the decade. Women were joining the for workforce. We were wearing shorter skirts. We were gaining our independence. Political corruption, vice culture, and rackets were at a high. Multi-ethnic voices were joining in the American chorus. The Klan of the 20s wanted to restore America to its past and prevent its future. We had become a true nation of immigrants, a melting pot of cultures, most of which didn't buy into prohibition, further angering the Klan who were ardent supporters of temperance and vehemently opposed to America's open arms to immigrants. The railroad was one of the largest employers of Kansas City, Kansas's Klan members during the 20s. And this is also where the Klan rubbed elbows with non-white workers, fueling more hatred. The Klan wanted the borders closed off in order to keep America for white Americans only. We often think of the KKK specifically hating and terrorizing African Americans, which is how it began in the 1860s, originating in Tennessee from a group of ex-Confederate soldiers. It started as a social club and quickly outgrew that, but the Klan's resurgence in the 20s in particular brought a stronger, more vigilant, militant hatred of all non-white, non-native, non-Protestant people, including Catholics. Lynchings of Italians, Jer Jewish and Mexican immigrants, for example, were also common. The Klan saw themselves as the ultimate law and order group serving America, taking justice into their own hands when the government wouldn't. A comparison can somewhat be made to the machine, an outsider group that ultimately usurped local governments and expanded control off the backs of labor, minority and immigrant vote, creating a sort of web of Pendergast men in places of power through bossism. We were mired in this corrupt power structure known by many names, machine politics, pressure politics, saloon politics, or bossism. Bossism was the unofficial system that controlled many American cities. It was a complex organization of party men who worked at the grassroots level to nominate candidates, deliver votes, and share in the spoils of victory, some of it legal, most of it not. It was a system that relied on bribery, bullying, and straight up lying and cheating to set key people in crucial positions. Pendergast had friends elected as county judges. He had sway at the local, state, and national level. But even as his control extended into big time power positions, he still had to keep his loyal constituents happy. He paid their rent when they needed, shoveled out however many dollars necessary to maintain their faith in him. But where did all this money come from? He had somewhat clean money from his Pendergast wholesale liquor company and also from the happenings of the Jefferson Hotel. But the real money at this point stemmed from the cuts he made from brothels and other vice rackets that he supported and protected. Kansas City's Scarlet District dates back to as early as 1840s and 1860s when women began gathering along the river to entertain the dozens of steamboats and steamboat men that might be lined up along the banks. As steamboating gave way under the success of the railroads, the district expanded to surround the growing communities south and into the dusty bottomland where hotels brimmed and deep pocket with deep pocketed cattlemen. Even as the law came knocking on the doors of brothels, more prostitutes filled in and spread Kansas City's original red light, dotting the streets just south of the Missouri River. Kansas City by now had become a popular town with many visitors and plenty of accommodations such as horse-drawn streetcars, food, hostelry, retail shops, and of course, cabarets, live theater, and all the offerings of its red light district. Yet with all this refinement, economic success, here was still a town dumping garbage in the Missouri River and living among the dust and filth of mostly unpaved roads. We were engulfed in the stockyard fumes and the waste of the West Bottoms. Often residents complained of witnessing dead animals in the street and floating down the river. We were in the throes of growth, kicking and screaming along the way. 
Red light districts first were created in Japan as a means to gather all legal brothels in a spot on the outskirts of cities swept around the globe and especially flourished in the new world. And so it was in Kansas City when most of the early red light district activities were concentrated in the Northland. Brothels ranged from low-end cribs where single women worked alone to assassination houses where rooms were available to sex workers on a more informal part-time and casual basis to higher end resorts full of well-groomed girls managed and maintained by businesswomen referred to as madams. Brothels were also referred to as sporting houses that were filled with sporting women. The sportiest among them was Kansas City's most famed and successful madame, the queen of the red light district herself, Annie Chambers. She was born Leanna Lovell in 1842 down in Lexington, Kentucky. For a while, she led a fairly simple life, but one that would quickly devolve into a series of tragedies, leading her path to drastically change course. She moved away from Kentucky and found a new life in prostitution. Chambers then opened her famous Annie's Resort on the cusp of the completion of the Hannibal Bridge, which guaranteed her overnight success. The Hannibal Bridge, built by Octave Chanute in 1869, brought the first ever railroads barreling over the previously unbridgeable Missouri River and directly into Kansas City, and with it came thousands of curious tourists, travelers, businessmen who landed not far from her enticing doorstep. Chambers quickly rose to become the most successful madame west of the Mississippi. She operated her opulent two-story, 25-room, top-of-the-line brothel filled to the brim with expensive furniture and elegant glass chandeliers at 201 West 3rd Street in the present-day popular residential district, the River Market. The dining room and ballroom were decked out in red and gold with extravagant paintings. Chambers women were known all around the nation for being beautiful, smart, and well-mannered. At any time, she had a staple of 15 to 20 girls who made nearly 200 a week, half of which they got to keep. That would get them making around 2,000 in today's uh, equivalent. A glimpse into the district can be seen from the view of author John Edward Hicks, who writes in his book, Adventures of a Tramp Printer, published in 1950, that in the 1880s, the assortment of pleasure girls in Kansas City ranged from high-priced beauties kept by Annie Chambers on Wyandotte Street to the cheap crones at Lone Cottonwood provided presided over by Mother Smith. In between, there were Nellie Scott's Place on West 4th, Lou Regards on Walnut, Molly Papa's on Grand, M. Williams on 3rd, Bessie Stevenson on Broadway, Millie O'Brien's at 1st and Main, Dutch Annie's at Lewis's Place, and a tent kept by the notorious Becky Reagan at the foot of Main Street. This would literally be a tent along the river. Chambers advertised in a freely circulated black book where potential clients could get a sense of what and whom they'd find at any certain brothel. By 1915, Kansas Cityans admittedly spent 1.5 million on public prostitutes. As with early Sumerian times, Kansas City had found a way to incorporate sex tourism as an attractive asset to visitors. This vice was tolerated just enough by residents because of its economic value and its segregation from the lives of average citizens stowed and bound to marginalized neighborhoods. In the 1923 report, 10 Years of Fighting Vice in Kansas City, the Society of Suppression of Commercialized Vice claimed that the moral house cleaning of body houses was in full effect, thanks in part to the passing into law of the injunction and abatement law, which forced brothels to shut down. The society stated that in its report, it had been tried for years to pass the law and believed that women gaining the right to vote finally made it happen in 1921. The zenith of, zenith of Boss Tom's political control lasted from the era of World War I through Prohibition and the Great Depression. By the great age of bootlegging in Kansas City, Pendergast had established a truly wide open town. What does that mean? It meant that any vice racket, illegal, speakeasy, gambling den, or brothel could operate with little to no police interference. This became especially beneficial to the Sicilian immigrants who controlled most of the rackets from 1920s on. With the Italians growing in control of vice operations just behind Pendergast and his control of the police force through home rule, police officers knew exactly who could not be arrested under any circumstances. Jim Pendergast had forged early political connection to the Italians when he partnered with Joe D'Amico against the Republicans. 
Damico knew that the importance of maintaining and building on this new relationship between Tom Pendergast and the fresh-faced Italian immigrants like Johnny Lazia. The value was obvious. Both sides got what they wanted and the well-oiled machine ran without fail. Boss Tom Pendergast saw the Sicilians not as a blight on the city, but as an opportunity. By providing a political structure that allowed the mafia to operate its rackets freely, Pendergast gained the brute and the brawn of a group that had cut its teeth on sawed off shotguns. Here's Johnny Lazia, born to laborers in Brooklyn in 1897. He was reared in the poor overcrowded neighborhood of Kansas City's Little Italy, and he was destined to end up with the most powerful men in crime. Lazia continued to form lasting relationships through the power of giving money and resources to those in need, as long as they did what he asked of them, embodying the same mentality of his soon-to-be partner, Tom Pendergast, and machine politics. In 1913, the Research Bureau of the Board of Public Welfare published a social prospectus of Kansas City, showing evidence of crime, illness, dilapidated housing, and other social ills that plagued the Pendergast-run districts, containing large populations of mostly immigrant and minority groups, the exact people the Pendergast machine relied on for votes. Although the vice culture of prostitution and gambling and booze flourished even before the city's inception into the turn of the century, its lushest era was at the height of the Pendergast machine's most powerful decade, the 20s and the 30s. By 1928, Lazio was named president of the new Northside Democratic Club at Fifth and Grand Avenue, a gesture that forced Tom Pendergast to recognize his legitimate stronghold on the North End. Through the new Democratic Club, Lazia organized thousands of Italians into a joint political front. He was a suave man who kept a so-called library of classics in one corner of his office and became an indispensable component and proponent of the Pendergast machine. During the Pendergast reign, Lazia became the first out front above the law, ruthless mob boss of the Northland, and he was our go-to man for bootleg liquor, speakeasies, vice rackets, brothels, and burlesque houses. Most burlesque houses could be found in the working class neighborhoods, of course, with brothels and saloons as their neighbors. Burlesque houses attracted thousands of attendees weekly. The vice district grew south with the city stretching along 12th to 18th streets and from Oak Street to the Paseo Boulevard, mirroring the development of Kansas City's jazz district where more than 50 clubs thrived. 18th and Vine is mostly known for its jazz houses, but it also harbored a deviant ethos where female impersonators, drag shows, live sex shows, burlesque and prostitution flourished. Downtown, the 1300 to 1400 block along Cherry became a sort of tourist attraction. Guests from out of town would walk the sidewalks along Cherry to see the women sitting in the windows in their slinky garments. Jazz musicians were often hired to entertain guests in the higher end brothels after their earlier evening gigs ended. At 12th and Cherry Streets near present day City Hall, the Reno Club, also known as the House of Swing, attracted guests to a marijuana smoke filled room where prostitutes worked freely. Manager Sol Steibold employed taxi dancers and call girls who could be hired for as little as 10 cents a dance or hired for $2 to take them in to the upstairs brothel. The sensation of taxi dancing swept through the working class venues in the 1920s and was so called relating the dancer's time spent with her customer to that of a taxi driver giving a ride to a stranger. Taxi dancing provided a platform for young unmarried men and women to dance, although the stigma was that of prostitute and John. The Reno served beer for a nickel and scotch for 50 cents. The segregated venue, like most in Kansas City at the time, kept white folks downstairs and black folks in the balcony or on a small bleachers by the bandstand. A lunch wagon hitched up close by served liver, pig snouts, ears, hog maws, pig stomach, fish, chicken, and pork tenderloins. A well-known house of prostitution from the corner of 11th and was on the corner of 11th and Cherry Streets. Here, 16 girls were on duty at any given time. This establishment was entirely protected by Charles Carollo, lead mob man under Johnny Lazia in the late 1920s. In 1932, Chief of Police Robert E. Phelan submitted a comprehensive report of all of his finding of immoral places and street solicitation. 
His list of establishments included apartments and houses concentrated on 13th and 14th blocks in the heart of downtown. According to a Kansas City Times journalist, the girls would hiss at prospective clients to get their attention. The list named several hotels, including the following located near Fifth and Wyandotte and present day residential area of the River Market. Black Lead, Panama, Rollo, Jackson Hotel, there was Hotel Corrine, El Tor Hotel, Holmes Hotel, and many, many others. The Hotel Central Annex located on East 12th Street employed porters with a mission to ask guests if they desired the companionship of pretty girls. At the height of their reign, Boss Tom Pendergast and Johnny Lazia were virtually impossible to oppose. And where the success of the Jim Pendergast suede vote relied on the real commitment and support of his constituents to get out and vote, Tom knew that the path to his sustained power was a total control of the ballot box. As the 20s gave way to the 30s, the era of the ghost votes commenced, and along with it, the greatest level of machine-instigated bloodshed. James Blackie Outit, so-called bag man of Boss Tom, admitted that his job was to give addresses to vacant lots. Then he would assign those addresses to prostitutes, to thieves, floaters, deceased, or anyone he could get on the voting registration books. On election day, he hauled them in to vote whichever way Boss Tom demanded. Laws literally meant nothing. Dozens of voters in the 1930 election registered using Fairyland Park address, a, loco a location that contained only roller coasters and no residences. The machine did what it wanted. Ballot boxes were often stolen and honest voters were chased away from the polls. If they made it to the polls, they'd find that they had already voted and would be asked to leave. Sometimes voting days ended in violence with skulls cracked, eyes gouged, and victims in opposition severely wounded until they promised to deliver the correct vote. Those who'd take a hot meal in exchange for voting whichever way the boss told them to were always welcome at his massive Christmas dinners Boss Tom continued to host in the Northland. Pendergast also relied on the thousands of owners or employees of machine-to-owned racketeers in the gambling dens. If they didn't comply, they'd be threatened. His cronies provided upward of 60,000 votes for machine-backed politicians. Among these voters were registrants who often shared the same home address, that of, you guessed it, vacant lots. Henry McKissick was the leader of the 15th Street crowd and he won a small political role in the second ward when 18,500 write-in votes were magically cast in his favor. The kicker was that that precinct did not even have 18,500 voters, a detail overlooked by the election board. In a future election, McKissick, Charles Menaggio, and several others weren't so lucky when the Kansas City Star performed a thorough investigation and, in, and indicted McKissick and George Clark, who was a former IRS investigator, with charges of voter fraud. Of course, it was only a matter of time before burglars found a way into the courthouse and stole the ballots in question, disappearing all evidence. Kansas City in the 30s was so infested with corruption that citizens were afraid to tell the truth. At this point, the director of police had total control of the police force. But who chose the director of police? The city manager. Who was the city manager? Henry McElroy, and he was one of the most, he was one of four most influential men in the Pendergast machine. McElroy selected Eugene Reppert as director of the police at the behest, of course, of Lazia. In turn, this gave total control of the police force again to mob and mob ruled rackets. At this point, anyone gaining liquor licenses could only do so if they sold Pendergast owned booze or gained the blessings of the boss. Anyone permitted to build could only do so with his ready mix concrete company. It sounds corrupt because it was. Pendergast's pockets were dragging the ground from the weight of gold he made off the backs of the people, absolutely. Did the vice districts he helped develop and help flourish reflect violence, murder, mayhem, poor living conditions, questionable qualities of life? Yes, as evidenced by these police complaint maps, all of which were condensed into Pendergast controlled neighborhoods. But here's the thing, you can loathe him or you can love him, but Pendergast solely did keep the Great Depression away from Kansas City. He created 
massive jobs in construction. Some, and we constructed some of the most beautiful art deco buildings of our skyline. In, in most time, most cities suffered extremely during this time period. He simultaneously became filthy rich because he only allowed the concrete from his companies to be used building our skyline. Yes, Tom Pendergast was affiliated with brothels and cribs in the red light districts, but he also knew he had a needy clientele and the middle to upper class businessmen who worked in downtown. His men only cabarets reached a pentacle with the opening of the Chesterfield Club, located a block shy of Jackson County Courthouse. Gus Skinny Gargata, younger brother of Charles the Wop Gargata, two big mob men in Kansas City, owned the club, and it was located at 320 East 9th Street. The Chesterfield grain gained notoriety for its businessmen's lunch, where men could drink, gamble, and arrange political meetings with Boss Tom, all the while being serviced by high-heeled waitresses wearing dainty see-through cellophane aprons revealing pubic hair shaved into hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. The waitresses even shared the duties and no one suit was represented more than another on any given shift. Pendergast frequented the famed Chesterfield Club and conducted a lot of official business there by hosting city officials and ward bosses. The, through the Chesterfield, Pendergast helped funnel the sexuality of the jazz scene directly into Kansas City's business districts. The Chesterfield became a sought after tourist attraction and it continued to have the full support of Pendergast who vowed to protect the venue along with so many other joints as long as it only purchased liquid, liquor from his TJ Pendergast Wholesale Liquor Company. The club was eventually closed down in 1939 as a common nuisance. And so with the disappearance of its most infamous club went the city's most infamous boss. It's often noted that gambling, election fraud, and most notably tax evasion were the demise of the Pendergast regime. But those things alone are not entirely true. Kansas City's women were the self-appointed, self-anointed civic housekeeper housekeepers, and we comprise several groups of tenacious, steadfast women caught, and we all caught flack as pink-nailed, cocktail-drinking, cigarette-smoking Southsiders, but paid no mind. They got things done, nails painted or not. They made it their mission to sweep corruption out of the city and became more and more organized by the 1940 election, and defeat was imminent. On May 22, 1939, Thomas J. Pendergast, the untouchable Caesar who reigned from his 1908 Main Street office, was convicted twice of evading nearly half a million dollars worth of income tax between 1935 and 1936 and was sentenced to one year, three months imprisonment, five years of probation, and a fine of 10000 for each offense. He entered the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas on May 29, 1939, serving all 15 months. He fell ill and lived in poor health at 5650 Ward Parkway home until his death in 1945. The system that, that reigned during the Pendergast and Lazia era vanished immediately with the assassination of Johnny Lazia. After a night touring his nightclubs and other business endeavors, Lazia and his wife, accompanied by mobster Charles Carollo, headed back to the Lazio residence at 3 a.m., where Lazio was promptly attacked by submachine gun fire. He saved his wife by pushing her back in the car and demanding that Carollo speed off, leaving him slumped on the sidewalk. He died 11 hours later at St. Joseph Hospital on Linwood Boulevard in Kansas City after uttering the following words. Doc, what I can't understand is why anybody would do this to me. Why to me, to Johnny Lazia, brother John, who has been the friend of everybody. The community mourned indeed with 7,000 mourners in attendance. His funeral was one of the largest in little Italy's Holy Rosary Church nearby the gangster's childhood home. Char Charlie Carollo, Charlie Gagata and Charles Benaggio carried the casket and their friend to his final resting place. Despite the death of Lazia in 1939, federal agents, judges, and lawyers still describe Kansas City as the most politically corrupt, vice-ridden, wide-open city in the nation, one that merely winked at crime. This was the city that Lear Reed inherited when he took over as chief of police that year. It was obvious to Reed that a great culling of the police department needed to occur. 
Nearly 700 employees were investigated to determine ties to the old Pendergast regime. In his book, Human Wolves, Reed recalled that his police board and agency were totally rotten, foul mire of corruption both within and without the police department. After conducting an intensive study of Kansas City's vice peddling, he concluded with frankness that the Bowery, Barbary Coast, Chinatown, and Singapore and other infamous locales had nothing on the vice rings and built by design corruption of Kansas City. He described a city where opium pipes were in full glow, young girls would visit men for as little as 10 cents and boys got easily caught up in the gangs of bank robbers, thieves, narcotic peddlers. He made a hobby out of confiscating slot machines, also known as one-armed bandits, roulette wheels, chuckaluck, dice, outfits, and every other possible device that he claimed fattened the pockets of the leeches. According to Lear, the police headquarters and municipal courts building, shiny and new in 1938, housed two distinct groups of people, corrupt politicians, among the most notorious in America, and select good and honest policemen. After occupying the seat, there was no shortage of bribes thrown his way in favor of supporting gambling activities. Offers included money, meats, good clothes, tips for the racetrack winners, and generous shares of profits from prostitution, gambling rackets, and most of all, outlawed activities. Yet despite Reed's holier-than-thou reformist mentality, he was accused of using the anti-corruption campaign as an excuse to fire most Black officers who had been appointed prior to his leadership. He also was known to unfairly brutalize Blacks who were arrested. So rampant was this behavior that it attracted the NAACP. Police plus politics equals parasites, Lear said, in Kansas City or anywhere else. The sooner municipalities become convinced of this, the sooner the law enforcement throughout the nation will rid itself of deadheads, political nincompoops, potbelly pinheads, alleys of the underworld, grafters, chiselers, enemy of society, the cat spas, forward healers, and dishonest incompetence of other stripes and caliber. His great cleanup act of the 30s and 40s only led to the discovery of an unshakable millions dollar heroin racket that had been flowing through the streets and boulevards of Kansas City since 1920. Nicol Niccolo Impostato, a well-dressed Italian born immigrant who fled his homeland in 1927 when Mussolini was hot on the mafia, managed Kansas City's narcotics and heroin rackets. Police files detail the life of Impostato through a Counts of perjury, black hand executions, kidnappings, employment at both Roma Bakery, favorite hangout of the of most mobsters, and in the stop and shop liquor stores in Happy Hollow. Impostato said to have he had a seat at the Inner Council of the International Mafia Organization. The opium had made its way from Middle Eastern countries such as Turkey, Persia, and India, and was then transported through Italian ports into the great American mafia web that connected major hub major cities around the country, of which Kansas City was right along the ranks of Chicago and New York. The mafia had silently been operating its rackets with little to no objection from authorities or media until Senator Estes Kefauver demanded an intense national investigation. In the 1950s, with the hesitant support of President Harry Truman, Kefauver spearheaded a committee. For the first time, the Kansas City Narcotics Syndicate an eight state strong narcotics racket ran entirely by the Kansas City Mafia was exposed to the nation. Despite the obvious evidence, the 48 witnesses who testified put on quite a display of omerta or mob loyal silence. And there was no large cleanup of Kansas City as a result. Decades go in this manner and corruption shifts hands but remains in the power of the mob. The gambling and drug rackets of the 50s and 70s gave way to mob boss Nick Savella's more sophisticated and intricate endeavors tied to a bookmaking scheme involving bets on the 1970 Super Bowl IV, which pinned Kansas City Chiefs against the Minnesota Vikings. Quarterback Lynn Dawson was accused of being caught up in the scandal when his personal number was found in the phone of an arrested gambling man involved in the shenanigan. Despite the fact that the books were off and they might lose money, the mob called Chicago, who helped recook the books with what's called layoff bookmaking, a rebetting system that ensured profits. Toward the end of the decade, a final hurrah from Civella's mob was the Las Vegas casino skimming, referring to the transfer or moving of funds without proper documentation where it amassed 
upwards of $3 million in profits. After they were caught, this ultimately led to the downfall of an era of mafia stronghold, or did it? You might be tempted to ask specifics about the mob's operations in present day Kansas City, but if I told you, then you know, as they say, I'd have to kill you. Perhaps the people and places mentioned tonight don't deserve a front row seat in Kansas City history books alongside the do-gooders, but they, and they might just want to crawl back into the corners from which they came, but it does not really matter. They make us who we are. The good, the bad, the gritty gives us the strong heart that we have here in the Midwest. And so let's go out tonight with a toast and a cheers with that turn of the century spirit to continue to make all of our communities wonderful places in which to live. Thank you. Cheers from Kansas City. Cheers and thank you for the very illuminating presentation, Carla. Um, now we're going to um, go into the Q&A section. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat and Q&A. We already have some that have come in during the presentation. So I'm just gonna start from the top. So our first question comes from Donald Patillo from our Atlanta branch who asks, was St. Louis comparable to Kansas City during this time? Uh, yeah, you know, that comparison gets made often, even in present day, where all of us are always comparing ourselves to St. Louis and Kansas City. But as far as the mafia and corruption, I would say it's comparable. But Kansas City had some of the bigger named mafia that were more trusted in the like national game. So we had more control and more sway. Um, so I would always venture to say that not that it's a, a good thing to claim, but that Kansas City had, you know, with Boss Tom and with our mob men, definitely um, a stronger corruption and stronger scandals uh, than St. Louis. So our next question comes from Marilyn Campbell from the Princeton branch, who asks, uh, where does the nickname Squeezebox City come from? Huh. Oh, thanks for asking. That's a fun one. Um, so when I went down this path, so I, I'm a writer, I have my MFA in creative writing, and I love history, and I love storytelling. So when I graduated um, with my MFA, I decided to just jump into uh, writing this online magazine, Squeezebox City. And, you know, a squeeze box is a um, an accordion. That's a nickname for an accordion. Here's my logo. It's a kind of a embroidered, but anyway, so it's, this is my logo is an accordion with our skyline. And so I do all of my history presentations and all of my history stuff underneath that, um, that name, but I just love, you know, I love music and I love kind of throwback music. And so the accordion and squeeze box felt very appropriate for all of what I do. Thanks for asking that. And this is really fun to connect with people from around the country. This is great. Um, so uh, our next question is, I think, rather open-ended from Donald Patillo, again, from our Atlanta branch, who asks, uh, why no mention of Harry Truman? I guess he wasn't corrupt enough, but uh, yeah. Huh. Well, you know, that's interesting. I, you know, if you live around here or you run in the, the history circles, Truman is like, the most beloved person for everyone around. And he is written about and talked about so much. And, um, you know, it's actually kind of a tisk tisk thing to try to divulge, divulge the information about Harry Truman's relationship to Tom Pendergast. They were very close. And um, in fact, Truman came to the, you know, funeral and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, hair say about like the fact that Truman got elected in starting in politics because of um, because of Pendergast, which I think has some validity to that. But, you know, Truman is the the good natured boy from the Midwest. And this is just that that he is just not the focus of my research. So actually, at this point, those are all the questions that we have so far. What I'm going to do is if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to put them in. But I am going to move on to, oh, actually no question just came in uh, from someone in, from Kansas City, Jeff Schnabel. Um, wasn't it true that mainly due to Tom Pendergast and his control over liquor, Kansas City never experienced prohibition? 100%, which is why I, I, I make sure to always include the, you know, the thoughtful um, question of, you know, if you can like him or you cannot like him, but 
I mean, Pendergast allowed a lot of uh, um, endeavors to continue during prohibition. And there was never, I mean, we obviously were under a national, like federal uh, prohibition um, law, but Kansas City, you there was you could get alcohol anywhere. The black market um, um, speakeasies and the black market booze was, I mean, strong. People had, you know, there are stories of, of big caves full of alcohol all around, and you know, you could always ask the right person and get what you needed. Bell hops would, uh, if you tipped well enough, bell hops would um, put a bottle of booze in your suitcase. You know, there's stories of chickens, be, frozen chickens being stuffed with bottles that would get shipped to all the all the hotels and all. I mean, there's just story after story after story. And some of it's verifiable. Some of it, you know, with anything with history, you you uh, you don't know. Sometimes things get uh, out of proportion, m you know, myths and all of that. But there is absolutely evidence of a thriving drinking Kansas City culture during Prohibition. So uh, we actually have another question came in from Rosanna Hall uh, of the Indianapolis branch. And I believe this is actually a reference to Jeff's opening remarks, but perhaps you know, what inspired the many fountains of Kansas City? That's a really good question. I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer other than, um, you know, we, we were part of the City Beautiful movement. We were a city that was focused on its parks and boulevard systems like very early on. Um, which was kind of a controversial thing because it alienated when we put our boulevards in and we put our fountains in and we beautified the city, it sort of alienated minority com uh, minority communities. And we still, you can still drive through Kansas City and see the effects of that um, Parks and Boulevard and City Beautiful movement when all the fountains came in because now we have like big, big, huge um, sweeping spaces in between minority communities and business districts and stuff. So, you know, our city, I think, is so amazingly beautiful. And, you know, the trees that are we have huge trees that are planted and lined all of our boulevards. But it's it's a little bittersweet for me because I know what happened to so many communities when that came in. But um I don't know 100% why we wanted to have so many fountains, but it was part of the City Beautiful movement that happened at the turn of the century. Great, so our next question is from Evan Motes uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, asking, were there Irish gangs or other ethnic criminal, criminal syndicates that challenged Pendergast Sicilians as happened in Chicago and other cities? Well, so Pendergast was Irish, so he had the Irish vote and he had the Irish communities and the laborers and um, behind him. So they, you know, no one as far as mafia, you know, the Sicilians were unmatched um, because Pendergast brought with him the Irish Brotherhood um, behind him, too. So. All right, so our, our next question is from Julie Robinson, who asks, is it true that a speakeasy crossed the state line so patrons could avoid being arrested by crossing into Missouri? Yes, hi, Julie. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is true, this is called the State Line Tavern, and it's, it's, a, it's ridiculous, it's over the top, but it's absolutely true that it was, it spanned the state line, and so you just had to run over one line or the other if the police were coming in, um, depending on, you know, if you were drinking on the Kansas side, which was illegal. So yeah, the State Line Tavern, um, you know, there's, there's documentation of that tavern, and there's lots of uh, police reports and all kinds of um, newspaper um, articles and headlines about that tavern. So, yep, leave it to Kansas City to pull that one off. <laughs> Great. So um, I think we've come to the end of our questions. I'm now going to announce our two raffle winners. So our first winner is Andrea Nolan from the Los Angeles branch. Congratulations. Uh, Carla's holding Ooh. up the book that you've won. She'll sign that for you. And our other winner is uh, Janine Brakefield from our Naples, Florida branch. So congratulations to the two of you. I just want to thank you again, Carla, for that great presentation and for, ad for answering our questions. And now I'm going to pass things over to the executive director uh, of the English Speaking Union, uh, Karen Karpovich. Karen? Thank you so much, Carla, and thank you for ending a wonderful, wonderful series. You have the honor of being our, our final speaker for our, our second season of 
of happy hours and it's been a wonderful season and it's wonderful to top it off with you. It's always wonderful to hear a person that's in love with the city that they live in and they grew up in, I assume also. Mm -hmm. um, as a city dweller myself, I understand what that passion is. Thank you again. I also want to thank Jeff Schnabel for putting this event together. And I know he's impassioned about the city, Kansas City also. So we're in good company and we've learned a lot about your wonderful city, which I've been to, but I have to go back and see it in a different set of eyes. Have to look for those fountains. Mm -hmm. Have to look for those fountains. Um, I just want to thank uh, our happy hour committee, Karen Blair Brand, who's been the chair, and also Jeff Schnabel, Barbara Hughes, Gideon Faulkner Qua, hope I said that correctly, Gideon, Julie Dardenne, and Bill Kennedy. Thank you for an amazing season. I also want to mention to you a couple of things coming up. Uh, as you know, the English Speaking Union is a membership organization. If you wish to be a member, we encourage you to do so. You could do so by signing up on the form that you'll receive, which is an evaluation of the event, which I'm sure you all enjoy. And then finally, something a little different or maybe not very different because we're an organization of stories. On June 24th, in celebration of our centennial, we're going to be talking about 100 years, 100 stories. And we've asked all of you, our members, to tell us their remembrances and their, their kind of wonderful feelings about the ESU and why it's so important to you. And we're gonna have a competition in terms of which ones stand out and really tell the best stories about our organization. So I ask you to submit stories or come join us on June 24th for a great event. Thank you again for the committee and to all our participants because we've had an amazing turnout and this has been a wonderful season and join us again when we come up with our next season of great speakers and thank you again carla bye